Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro, and I am your servant in Jesus Christ, and this is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God, because there's no shortage of crazy things being said out there. Now, if you've ever been told as a Christian that you need to learn how to hear uh, the voice of God, it's really up to you. you got to learn how to tune in to the Spirit or something like that so you can hear Him in your heart or your head. Or, but in one way or another, God is directly communicating to you. And we're not talking by the Bible, but by some other means directly to you. Yeah, go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below. Don't forget to hit the like button button and uh, don't forget to ring the bell either uh, yeah we're gonna work this out and demonstrate that the scripture actually teaches something called sola scriptura and yeah well it which means scripture alone and this is how god communicates to us presently so case in point we're heading down to the cedar uh, the, the trinity church at cedar hill as we listen to nar up and comer robert medieu and he's going to be delivering a message to a men's group, and the name of the message is, If These Ears Could Talk. Yeah, a little pseudo-profundity on his part going on there. Just saying, you know. Uh, so let's uh, whirl this up, and we'll get to it. Here is Robert Madu. Mark chapter 7. Start on verse 31. We'll land in verse 37. When you're ready to read it, say, yeah. yeah. Need some time to find it, say, hold up. That was, a, that was a faint hold up in the back. Look at what it says. It says, Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. Would you say deaf? Oh, come on. Say it like you would want him to hear you. Say deaf. Yeah. You're probably wondering what this is all about, you know, where, you know, the guy read part, reads part of a passage and then says, now say the word deaf, deaf. Now say it like you mean it, deaf. Yeah, well, there, there's a, there's, this is a psychological manipulation technique. The idea here is, is that each and every one of us has some defense mechanisms set up. And so if somebody t gives you a command and then you obey it, then what happens is your internal warning system goes from you know defcon 5 to defcon 2 and down below the idea here is it turns off critical thinking because well if the guy's giving you orders and you're obeying those orders well then you know there's nothing to you know be afraid of right so that's that's what the manipulation technique is about yeah he, he couldn't hear you he was deaf. Right. Deaf people generally do not hear others. It's something I've noticed about them. And he could hardly talk. Would you say hardly talk? And they begged Jesus. They begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he... <clears throat> Just read the text. <laughs> He spit and touched the man's tongue. Nasty. It is what it is. Uh-huh. He looked up to heaven with a deep sigh and said to him, Epitha, which means be open. At this, the man's ears were open. His tongue was loosened. And he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. I bet they did. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Can you say amen? Men, tonight, I, I want to talk to you, and I don't think I preach. I just want to just talk tonight. U using this as a title, If These Ears Could Talk. Okay, yeah. The ears generally don't talk. And so you'll note he's read out a text. That's, that's good. You should be reading out a text before you preach or teach so that you have a basis from which you're preaching and teaching. But the goal then is to help somebody rightly understand the true sense of the text, the true meaning of the passage. God is communicating something here to us through this text. And so where he's going to go from here, 
isn't really jiving with what he just did. You'll you'll see that. So he reads the text. He then ends with pseudo profundity. Oh, if these ears could talk. Woo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just, <clears throat> we continue. Now get ready. A hard left here because what comes up next doesn't seem to be connected at all, meaning-wise, with what he just read from the Gospel of Mark. If these ears yeah. can talk. Strange title, but that's a strange text with Jesus spitting on people. If these... That's not what happened. Ears can talk. Look at the brother next to you. Get in his face. Get in his personal space and say, Brother... I wonder. So here we go again. This is all part of the, you know, he gives a command, you obey, internal warning system goes down. What your ears would say, if your ears could talk. Oh, well, come on, give God a hand clap of praise and you can take your seat. If What are we giving God a hand clap of praise for exactly? You coming up with the weird pseudo profound title like if these ears could talk give god a praise for that would y'all these ears could talk brothers and brothers in the not too distant past i was at the place that has become my second home and that is dallas fort worth airport and, uh, all right so you'll notice now we're steering into autobiographical data regarding Robert Madu. So the life story is uh, going to be a vital thing here. And of course, my question is, what on earth does this have to do with Mark chapter 7? I was getting ready to take off for a flight and decided to grab the magazine in the seat in front of me just to take my mind off of the flight. I'm perusing through this magazine. All of a sudden, my attention was arrested by the title of an article in the magazine. The title of the article said, what happened when my pilot passed out? <laughs> Brothers, I don't know if I told you, I'm on the plane, <laughs> getting ready to take off for the flight. The, the, the article went in detail to talk about a man, a man who had just acquired his own private plane. And after acquiring this plane, he thought of nothing better to do than to call up one of his good buddies and just take him out on a flight. And so here these two men take off on the runway, suspended in the stratosphere, chillaxing in the atmosphere. <laughs> chillaxing in the atmosphere is a kind of NAR code speak for something different than flying. Weird how he's kind of come up with these strange double entendres. When little did they know, tragedy was about to strike. So, so just keep asking yourself, what does this have to do with the fact that Jesus opened the ears of a man who was deaf? Several thousand feet above sea level, their worst nightmare was about to occur. Because this pilot was a severe diabetic. And in the hustle and the bustle and the excitement of getting ready for the flight, he completely forgot to pack his insulin. So as the men are suspended in the air, all of a sudden this pilot starts shaking profusely. All of a sudden his eyes start rolling in the back of his head. He starts sweating and his friend looks at him and says, man, are you okay? And he starts shaking more violently and ultimately passes out in the pilot seat of this plane. This friend did what any of us would do. He was nervous, he was panicking. He's like, man, are you okay? Are you okay? He started shaking his friend and saying, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. But there was no response at all. This man was completely passed out in the pilot seat of this plane. This friend frantically went to the back of the plane and he tried to find a first aid kit or something, but this friend was completely unresponsive. And the man got nervous because he could feel the plane starting to descend and he grabs the radio and starts shouting out, Mayday, Mayday, please, please, somebody help me, somebody help, is there anybody out there? He sat and waited for a response. There was no response at all, and seconds turned to minutes, and minutes turned to several minutes, and all of a sudden, the cold fear began to grip his heart that his last moments were going to be on that plane. 
He went back to his friend and said, wake up, wake up, wake up. He still wouldn't get off. But all of a sudden, faintly, he hears on the radio a voice saying, hello, I hear you. He said, yes, 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 please, please, somebody help me, somebody help me. The voice said, sir, are you a pilot? He said, no, I'm not a pilot. I'm, I'm just a passenger. My, my friend, he passed out. But please, please, you got to help. Great delivery, by the way. I mean, this guy is a very skilled communicator. It's just that he's not a skilled biblical exegete because this story has nothing, and I mean nothing, to do with Mark chapter 7. Hmm. Help me, the plane's going down. The voice from the control tower said, sir, I need you to calm down. I can see your exact location. If you will calm down and listen to me, I will show you how to land this plane. Brothers, how many know the next moments in that man's life were critical? How many know he didn't say, oh, you sure you want me to push this button because I'd rather push this button over here? No, he was completely submitted to that voice. In fact, the article... Completely submitted to that voice. Again, notice the <clears throat> NAR, Christianese buzz phrases that are woven into the story. Uh-huh. Con concluded saying that man landed that plane with ease and perfection simply because he obeyed the instructions of a voice that he could hear but could not see. <sighs> yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, you know those pseudo profundities, man. Whoop! Just, that was just amazing. You see, he, he hangs it out there. Look how amazing I am and how I can draw these connections. This has nothing to do with Mark chapter 7. Brothers, I share that story with you tonight because I think that story is a lot like life and a lot like manhood. Because I don't care whether you are 8 or 80 in here tonight, nobody in here is an expert on life. Nobody in here is an expert on manhood. They don't hand you a syllabus when you become a man. And Notice this is a men's group that he's preaching and teaching. To say this is what you got to do. And as I said this morning, life can hit you with some uncertainty. Life can hit you with some stuff that you did not see coming. And I came to tell you tonight, you better learn how to grab a radio called prayer and start crying out to God saying, mayday, mayday, mayday. God, I'm about to crash my life. Show me how to be the man of God you've called me to be. Show me how to be the husband you've called me to be. You better cry out to God and wait to hear his voice. Now, this is where we're going to take a look at passage number one, actually one and two of Scripture on the concept of sola scriptura, because here he's saying that we need to pray, God, I'm going to crash my life. Show me how to be a good husband and things like this. Now, being a good husband falls under the category of a good work. This is exactly what Scripture teaches us, things like this are addressed in Scripture. But to kind of talk about authority of Scripture, we're going to work first and foremost with some words that Jesus gives. You're all familiar with the passage of Scripture called the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Jesus says something there that's very important as it relates to the voice of God, if you would, and where, you know, where we are to trust that we are hearing God's word and hearing his voice and where we shouldn't, yeah, the things like that. So here's what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and said to them, them being his disciples, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and then note, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Te teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Hmm. So, as far as being a disciple of Jesus Christ, what gets put forward in front of us as disciples is all that Christ has commanded. Now, that just begs the question. And the question is this, where can I go today? today to hear what all that Christ has commanded, all that Christ has taught. You know, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, where can I go and know with certainty that what I am being taught is what Christ has commanded? Answer, well, Jesus said to his disciples, 
the one who hears you hears me. The one who hears you hears me. This is what Jesus said to his disciples who became the apostles. And so where can I go today? Where can I? Let me think about this. To find, you know, to find those, all the things that Christ has commanded. Oh, I know. It, it, that would be the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, you're thinking, well, didn't the disciples only write the New Testament? Yes. So you'll note then that, that everything is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, prophets being the Old Testament authors, and, and Jesus affirms that what the Old Testament authors wrote is the Word of God. Um, you know, every portion of the Tanakh, that's the Old Testament as we know it, is quoted from Christ as being authoritative, as being God-breathed, as being the very Word of God, so we know that. So Jesus being God, we can go to the Old Testament and know with certainty we're hearing the voice of God. And then the question is, where can I go to find what the apostles, Jesus' is apostles, the ones he sent, where can I go to find what they've written? Because Jesus wrote, didn't write any books. He didn't write anything while he was, he didn't have a publishing deal with Simon and Schuster or anything like that. No, everything that he taught and did and said, it's all recorded for us by the eyewitnesses. So that being the case, next passage of scripture, you think of somebody like the Apostle Paul, warning us about the treachery of the last days, which we find ourselves in. He says, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, narcissists. This is, you know, this is a rise of narcissism, an epidemic of, of it in our society. And you'll note that this is exactly what the Apostle Paul prophesied under the Holy Spirit. They will be lovers of money. They will be proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, uh, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Yeah, that sounds like a great description, right? Um, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. So this is what's going to happen. This is going to be visibly manifesting within, of all places, the visible church, which makes no sense because Christians are penitent sinners who bear the fruit of the Spirit. These people sound like the opposite of it. So they're like apostates. They're not, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. And Paul says, avoid such people. And uh, for, for among them are those who creep into households, capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning, never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses. By the way, Janus and Jambres, it doesn't say it in the Old Testament, but here uh, this is an affirmation of this information. Janus and Jambres were sorcerers who worked for Pharaoh. Uh, you know, when, Fer when Moses went and you know confronted pharaoh and then he had his uh staff turn into a serpent uh it was janice and jambres who also made their staffs turn into serpents so just as janice and jambres opposed moses so these men also opposed the truth they are corrupted in mind disqualified regarding the faith but they will not get very far for their folly will be plain to all as was that of those two men but you however so we christians and here specifically, talking to pastors, in particular Pastor Timothy here in Ephesus, he says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. That's a promise. It's a, <laughs> if it hasn't happened to you yet, just give it time, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, now watch where his emphasis is, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And now here's the note. So you'll note, he's pointing him to the sacred scriptures. 
Paul, as he's getting ready to die, is not pointing people to their heart, saying, you need to learn how to hear the audible voice of God. He's saying, no, pay attention to the sacred scriptures, to the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation. And then here's the best part. All scripture is theonoustos. It is breathed out by God. This is why Hebrew says that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete uh huh, and equipped for every, all, every good work. There is no good work that God would prepare you for, including being a good husband, being a good wife, being a good child, a good employer, a good employee, a good government official. Name the, the vocation where you're doing your good works. God's Word, the written Word of God, all Scripture, it will train you and equip you for every good work. Notice it doesn't say some. Some good works you're going to have to hear the voice of God. No, every every good work that you would do as a Christian is going to you're going to be equipped by the written word of God. And that's what the apostle Paul is saying at the end of his life. So keep that in mind as we come back to Robert Madu as he's saying that we need to get on the radio the voice of prayer and say mayday mayday I'm going to crash. Now, granted, we as Christians need to pray, but watch where he goes next with this. It is the subject of hearing the voice of God that I really felt impressed to talk about you tonight. So notice, I'm going to back this up. Another form of manipulation. It's, it's the subject of hearing the voice of God that I felt impressed to talk to you about tonight. Well, that has nothing to do with Jesus giving the ability for a deaf man to hear. You see, you notice Mark chapter 7, why did he even read it? Because what he feels impressed, and by the way, when somebody says, I felt in my heart that God is telling me that I need to tell you such and such a message, that person is claiming to hear directly from God. So if you are opposing or questioning what he's saying, well, the person you're opposing and questioning is not Robert Madu, it's God himself. I mean, because God laid it on his heart, so who are you to challenge God? Yeah, notice the, the severe manipulation that goes on when, you, when people talk like this. It is the subject of hearing the voice of God that I really felt impressed to talk about you tonight, talk with you tonight, because if you are ever going to be the man that God has called you to be, you have got to learn how to hear his voice. If you're ever going to be the father he has called you to be, you've got to learn how to hear his voice. If you no biblical text says that. Uh-uh. We're pointed by Scripture back to the Scripture. You're going to be the son that he's called you to be. You have got to learn to hear the voice of God. No biblical text tells you that you need to learn how to hear the voice of God. Hearing his voice is critical. It's critical, he says. You'll never step into your purpose until you hear his voice. No text says that. You will never do anything great for God until you hear his voice. No text says that either. Mm hmm Yep. I would point out that, uh, you know, that many, many well-known theologians never claim to hear the word of God. You think of Luther and Calvin and others. No, they always heard the word, they always heard the voice of God in the written scriptures. They never claim to hear audibly from God. Give us some scripture for that, Robert. I'll give you some scripture. Now I'm going to back this up and watch what he does next, because this is, this is a demonic twist. Here we go. Until you hear his voice. You will never do anything great for God until you hear his voice. Give us some scripture for that, Robert. I'll give you some scripture for that. Come on, do you remember in the book of Hebrews chapter 11? I love it. It's the Hebrews Hall of Faith. And the writer of Hebrews goes straight ESPN, and he starts naming all of these mighty men of God, talking about all the exploits they did. And it says, by faith, Enoch was taken up and did not experience death. And by faith, Abel offered up a better... Now, this is true. What he's saying about uh, Hebrews up to this point is 
accurate enough. Sacrifice that came by faith. Noah built the first Titanic and there was no forecast of rain. By faith, Abraham went to a place that God was going to show him. Any great man that ever did anything great for God, he did it by faith. Oh, bro. Yeah, that's right. By faith. Brothers, help me preach tonight. He did it by faith. The Bible says that without faith. Actually, Hebrews 11 says without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right. Trust in God. Faith. That's what faith is. It's impossible to please God. What is faith? Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. So far, he's still in Hebrews 11. Faith is important. How do I get faith? Faith comes by jumping up and down in church. Now, so the question that before us is, how does one get faith? This is where he's going to get really super sneaky because he's not going to be quoting from Hebrews 11. He's going to be quoting from Romans 10. Oh, no. Faith comes by lifting some weights. No. Oh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That means if I'm going to believe that God is who he says he is and can do what he's called me to do, I got to have faith. And that faith is predicated upon my ability to hear. You got to hear. You need. And that's not true at all. Let me explain. So you'll note then he was quoting from Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it, by faith, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through, through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Him for who would ever draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. So faith is, you know, without it you can't please God. Now what He then did is He didn't reference the fact that He was quoting from Romans chapter ten. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, or you can say by the word of Christ, because actually that's more accurate to what our earliest manuscripts say. But um, let me show you the context of, of what he just quoted, because he said, well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by uh, the word of, of God, that means it, you have to hear God's voice. <laughs> Romans 10, verse 14, will give us the beginning of our context here, where it says, How then will they call on him whom they have not believed? Paul is kind of asking a question that is basically based upon the previous point that he had made. So verse 11 says, the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. See, that's a great promise. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So then his next question is, well, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Uh huh. How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Note then that the hearing the word of Christ is hearing through the voice of a preacher who is sent to preach the word of God. It's not about you learning how to hear the voice of God, as Robert Madu is saying. No, it's about Faith coming by the fact that somebody was sent who is preaching the gospel, preaching the very word of God from Scripture to you, and then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. You get the idea here. So what Robert Madu here was just utterly deceptive. He twisted the Scriptures, took Romans 10 out of context— uh, in fact, Romans 10, 17 out of context, and tacked it on 
to uh, Hebrews 11.6 and didn't even tell anybody that he was now quoting from Romans chapter 10. But if you read it in context, because remember, the three rules for sound biblical exegesis are context, context, and context. Put it back into context, and you can see by ripping uh, Romans 10, 17 out of context and tacking it onto the way he was handling Hebrews 11, he now has created the false impression that you need to now hear the voice of God, and you're never going to learn your purpose. You're never going to do anything great for God until you learn how to hear God's voice. That's not what the scripture says. Let me back this up again just a little bit. By the word of God. That means if I'm going to believe that God is who he says he is and can do what he's called me to do, I got to have faith. And that faith is predicated upon my ability to hear. No, it's not. You got to hear. You need to know his voice as much as you know his word. Notice he's making a distinction between the voice of God and the word of God. All scripture is theonoustos, it's God-breathed, and it will equip me for every good work. I hear the voice of God because it's living and active. It was breathed out by God. I hear the voice of God in the written scriptures. See, if you know his word, but you don't know his voice, then you're a Pharisee. Uh, (laughs) So if you know his word, but you don't know his voice, you're a Pharisee. Yeah, this guy doesn't understand the history of the Pharisees. The reason why the Pharisees were wrong was not because of their great knowledge of the Scriptures. It's because they added to the Scriptures. Yeah, they added to the Scriptures the hand-washing and all this kind of... In fact, they had a whole body of work known as the tradition of the elders that they added on to the Scriptures. It's not because they knew the Scriptures, it's because they added to it. Uh Uh-huh. Because the Pharisees knew the word. They had it memorized. No, they had only, they, they only had a little bit of respect for the Tanakh. They added to it the whole tradition of the elders. But they didn't know his voice. So when he showed up in the flesh, they called Jesus a devil because they didn't know his voice. Yeah, let me see something here. See if I could do this from memory really quick. Mark chapter 7. Yeah, so Mark chapter 7, same chapter that he apparently was uh, working with earlier on. Here's what it says. The Pharisees gathered to Jesus with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, and they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, they were unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. It's not that they were followers of Scripture. They had... They had the uh, written Torah, and they had the oral Torah, known as the tradition of the elders. And so when they came from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash. There is no command, by the way, in anything written by Moses or any of the biblical prophets commanding people to wash their hands. That command is in the tradition of the elders. And so they don't eat unless they wash, and there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels. And so the Pharisees and the scribes asked Jesus, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? No, it doesn't, they, notice they didn't say, why don't your disciples, uh, you know, how come they don't walk according to what Moses wrote? No, 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 according to the tradition of the elders. Yeah, they added to the Bible. They eat with defiled hands. And so Jesus said, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you, you hypocrites? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. And watch what Jesus says, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Uh huh. So note that the, uh, the Pharisees were not sola scriptura guys. They added to the word of God. And as a result of it, they were teaching the commandments of men. So what Robert Madu here just said and let me back this up so that we can listen to it again, that if you don't hear the voice of God, but you know the Word of God, well, that makes you a Pharisee. Well, what's fascinating here is that Robert Madu doesn't know his Bible, and he doesn't understand at all what it is that made the Pharisees the Pharisees. Now here, you need to know his voice as much as you know his Word. Amen. See, if you know his Word, but you don't know his voice, then you're a Pharisee. Because the Pharisees knew the word. They had it memorized, but they didn't know his voice. So- yeah, the Pharisees added to the scripture, made it void, following the commandments of men. That's what Jesus said. I'm going to go with Jesus on this one rather than you, Robert. When he showed up in the flesh, they called Jesus a devil because they didn't know his voice. On the other hand, if you know his voice, but you don't ground what you hear in the word of God, 
then you're not a Pharisee, you're a fanatic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, I think you get the point. No point belaboring this any further. So hopefully you found this helpful. If so, please like the video down below and subscribe and ring the bell. And of course, all the information on how you can support the ongoing work and ministry of Pirate Christian Media, as well as Fighting for the Faith, all that, those links on how to like join our crew, become a patron on Patreon, or send in a one-time contribution, all of that information is down below in the description. So if you found this helpful, please share it with others, and hopefully now you have a basis then for the bi biblical concept of sola scriptura. It really is based upon who's who can you trust. There's the only place I can go where I know for sure that I'm hearing the voice of God. It's in the Old Testament and in the writings of the apostles. It's just that simple. Old and New Testament, that's the place I can go and the apostle Paul at the end of his life points Timothy to that to the uh, the scriptures and says that they will make you complete and equipped for every good work. There are no commandments of men in the Scripture. There's no fanatical, bizarre, false prophecies found in the Scriptures. You can trust the voice of God in the Scriptures because it's theanoustos. It's God-breathed. It's living and active. So hopefully you found this helpful. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. Amen.